Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our last session of this virtual gift uh, uh, workshop. Uh, my name is Elder Pereira. I'm a member of uh, the Committee of Education, and I welcome uh, all of you uh, to this final session. Uh, one of the most interesting things and uh, one of the things I, I love the most in geosciences is, is that uh, we can travel all over the world without uh, leaving our uh, living room. And um, today it's a, a nice example of that. And uh, during the week, we already uh, traveled uh, uh, in different parts of, of Europe. We have been in Rome, Italy, Belgium, Brussels, and uh, even Machu Picchu in Peru. So today we will we'll continue traveling uh, to different parts of the world. And we will have uh, two uh, presentations uh, uh, that will show the interdisciplinarity between uh, geosciences. Uh, so we are lucky to have with us um, uh, from Greece uh, an expert in uh, climate. Uh, so Christos Zephos uh, will present us. Um, okay. Uh, can you share your uh, first slide, please, with us, Christos? We'll make a presentation. <clears throat> about uh, the relationship between science and even art. Can we mention that? Mm -hmm. So we will speak about uh, Tambora and the relationship between the volcanoes, geophysics, climate and, and art. So Christos, thank you very much for joining us and uh, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Elder. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon to everybody. <clears throat> Um, I have put that uh, little strange title, Volcanoes, Geophysics, Climate and Art. Of course, uh, <clears throat> the interest uh, of volcanoes and how they interact with our environment has been a subject that uh, has been used in literature, in paintings, in poesy, <clears throat> but here I, I, I will show you some evidence how all these things can link together. And uh, I'm giving examples. The major example would be the Tabora, Tambora eruption in 1815, which created the year without the summer in 1816 and uh, lots of other nice things. So let's start first with some pictures of these uh, magnificent uh, features of our planet. And you can see in the first uh, slide. <clears throat> what important and great volcanic phenomena, weather phenomena occur uh, in uh, big but smaller than Tabor, Tambora uh, volcanoes. This is the eruption from uh, Etna. This is the Lucky, the well-known Lucky in Iceland. The lucky we know in history that it had uh, created uh, this uh, large anomaly <clears throat> uh, in the decade of uh, uh, 1780. And uh, that anomaly can be seen as one moves. This, these are calculations by Jürg Lutherbacher and uh, one can see the anomaly progressing uh, in uh, the next uh, winter. And uh, uh, one can see also the year as it is called without the summer. Now here are a series of uh, <clears throat> 
solar irradiance and uh, temperature anomalies that people tried in the past to link them together, which is to link the quasi circular 11 year solar cycle to larger uh, deviations of uh, air temperatures all over <clears throat> the globe. Uh, also the solar irradiance, but all forcings, including man-made forcing from carbon dioxide releases are included. And uh, we now know that mother nature is controlling a large part, but man-made uh, global warming is now uh, contributing more than 30% to the, the changes in, the, um, in our climate. <clears throat> Following that Tambora eruption, Lord Byron, a famous poet from the UK, wrote a beautiful poem, Darkness. And he starts with the famous, I had a dream, the same sentence used by Martin Luther King. But that dream, which was not at all of a dream, uh, it, it was reality. He lived the, the situation following the Tambora eruption. And he, he actually he, he was having vacation in uh, Lake Geneva. And uh, he, he couldn't believe what he saw because every day and every night there were everywhere thunderstorms and uh, rain and uh, darkness and uh, blackening of, uh, uh, as he says, the moonless air. The Volcanic aerosols, <clears throat> which uh, trigger, of course, uh, weather phenomena, but uh, they also uh, can uh, be seen in the uh, scattering processes of different colors in the sun. So we selected the, the three red, green, blue uh, colors to study how they were changing before, during, and following large volcanic eruptions. Um, in, uh, as I said, in paintings by great masters. Now here one can see the uh, three sets of curves, each set corresponding to uh, a solar, different solar zenith angle from 75 to 85 and 100 uh, degrees. And uh, uh, this, uh, these calculations have been done for the red to green ratio using the X's are for volcanic aerosols and the uh, peaks are uh, non-volcanic aerosols from the model. <clears throat> the optical depth we studied was first at 550 nanometers in the model. So here are some examples of uh, how we can, uh, what, what we get by studying uh, paintings, the AOD, the atmospheric optical depth from famous paintings. And what uh, to the right, what are the estimates from different methods? The, the volcanic eruptions that we have chosen include also Lucky and Tambora. Uh, one can see here that the AOD from uh, paintings correlates very well 
with the dust veil index so-called, which is an index that gives uh, an estimate of the burden of, um, of the load of, of ash that uh, is uh, flying over her, overhead and it is quite well uh, distributed um, over the globe, you know, in most cases. So here the correlation is quite high. And uh, uh, one can see the errors are quite small. And uh, here is a painting by Ted Turner, famous colorist and landscaper. And you can see uh, the colors as we see them with our eyes. And you can see now the colors as they, oh, I'm sorry, as, um, uh, as they form uh, from red to green ratios. You can see that uh, <clears throat> there are high ratios, R to G ratios uh, that are above the horizon and they are at angles which correspond pretty well to the overhead uh, aerosol. Here it's an unknown volcano <clears throat> uh, that erupted in 1809 <clears throat> and has uh, subsequently created with uh, a, a, an, another uh, volcanic eruption, uh, a, a change uh, in, the, in the red to green uh, ratio, which uh, resulted to atmospheric optical depth greater than 0.2. Now, as we all know, <clears throat> this is the famous Maynard map that um, shows the Napoleon's, Napoleon's uh, troops as they started like a thick uh, river. Uh, they moved to Moscow in, and in 1812. They returned in the winter time uh, with great losses in view of, of the harsh cold conditions that have been created there. I believe that part of it was due to uh, that unknown volcanic eruption. This was one of the coldest winters uh, uh, in, uh, in Moscow. Uh, uh, going back to the colors, one can see the effects of Tambora um, in 1817 in these two paintings by Kaspar David Friedrich. And uh, one can see the famous sunset after Tambora of the lady in front of the setting sun. Uh, sunsets without volcanoes can be typically like uh, the one to the right, which is by Kunsthalle, by it, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, exhibited in Kunsthalle Mannheim in Germany. Uh, <clears throat> here are other volcanic eruptions, Babuyan. And uh, we, we have compared it with uh, non-eruption conditions. And uh, one can see the, the difference by eye, but mostly the, the interesting thing is that uh, we have used 800 paintings by great, uh, great painters, great masters. And uh, we can uh, see that uh, above it's the dust veil index. Then below is the atmospheric optical depth from the paintings. And then there are different estimates of the uh, stratospheric aerosol optical depth and other optical depths that could be related to the volcanic eruptions. And uh, if one correlates the red to green uh, uh, ratio 
uh, between coarse and uh, high quality images, you can get still high correlations. We have uh, tested uh, <clears throat> paintings by Turner at the Tate Gallery and at the National Gallery in London. And uh, we think that the error is, uh, is, is relatively small. If one groups all these paintings <clears throat> with uh, non-volcanic and volcanic years, the AOD shows uh, both the dust veil index, the total sulfate from Zielinski et al. They, they all show an increase in uh, the aerosol content as we move in the industrialized period after 1901. <clears throat> the AOD in general has been increasing due to air pollution. Here is a, uh, a picture of uh, a late uh, great painter in Greece. He was considered one of the greatest Greek painters, um, a colorist who was uh, loving the Aegean Sea and he was painting in the Aegean Sea. So I have uh, asked him to organize an experiment to test our hypothesis according to which, as I said before, the red to green ratio in the, the painting is proportional to the aerosol overhead. We have uh, had uh, with us optical spectroradiometers. We have had uh, cameras, expensive cameras. And uh, at the same time, when he was painting, we have been measuring the aerosol overhead. The reason we have selected to go to the to Hydra Island, not far away from Piraeus outside of Athens, um, the reason why we, we used these dates, 19 and 20 June 2010, was that there was uh, expected to pass over uh, a, a larger case of Hasara, Saharan dust event. Uh, you can see the passage of the dust event shown here for the 19th uh, of June uh, and then uh, on, uh, on the 20th of June. And you can see how the aerosols as, as seen from, from space uh, uh, have been moving over the Aegean Sea. Now an MFR seven AOD retrievals at 500 nanometers on 19 and 20 uh, and uh, AOD retrievals uh, it can be seen here. And the dust concentration in micrograms per cubic meter can be seen to uh, the, the right. Uh, generally, the overpassing of the Saharan dust event could be seen peaking at about three kilometers above uh, overhead. And uh, one can see the evolution of, the, of, of, of that uh, aerosol passing over uh, by two instruments, an MFR and the microtopes. <clears throat> Here are the comparison of ratios uh, uh, given as aerosol measurements uh, in paintings uh, and uh, 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 as, as, uh, as they were with uh, microtops and uh, by other instruments. The interesting thing here is that uh, <clears throat> one can see that uh, the passage of, uh, to the left of, of the aerosol uh, that uh, happened on the 19 
could not be seen in, uh, in June 20, the, the day after. These are above our two paintings, which uh, show that uh, Hydra so-called uh, experiment. The painting is shows above the two paintings are uh, during the passage and after the passage, and below are uh, two two photographs taken at the same time, which do, do show the difference in the scattered light to the left relative to the scattered light in the, to, in the right, which was after the Saharan dust uh, event. The cosine of the solar zenith angle and the horizontal angle relative to the position of the sun uh, could uh, place actually could uh, describe the profile uh, and uh, compare also with the model. Let me show you, going back to the past, uh, the tambora. <clears throat> it, it's a very good example. Uh, eight, 18, 17, uh, it's uh, the year following the year without the summer. And uh, one can see that horizontally we have uh, similar red to green ratios, which is that means that the aerosol was well distributed through, uh, I mean, from east to west in the and north to south uh, in, in the horizon. Uh, one can see that there are minor differences. Uh, from north to south. And uh, uh, here uh, is another famous painting by William uh, Turner, uh, which uh, shows uh, that uh, the 1.44, it's quite high for the, uh, for, for the case of the volcanic aerosol as we have seen in the previous catalog. And uh, the Northern hemisphere versus temperature now following a volcano, zero is the year of the volcanic eruption. And one can see that the AOD anomaly from a number of uh, about 22, 23 volcanic eruptions do show what we know between uh, uh, the volcanic eruption and the drop of uh, air temperatures following the eruption. Uh, here we show the AOD anomaly from the paintings from actually based on red to green ratio. And as climatic uh, stations, we have used Basel, Berlin, Geneva, Greenwich, Moscow, Paris, Prague, Corfu, St. Petersburg, and Stockholm. Uh, the interesting thing is to see how uh, the, the air temperatures and the climatic anomaly imposed by the volcanic aerosol in uh, St. Petersburg, Stockholm, Rome, and Athens do show up in, in, uh, in uh, that uh, figure. Uh, <clears throat> I have to recall to you, this is uh, air temperature at uh, the meteorological observatories, climatological observatories in these four cities. And uh, one can see that following, uh, for instance, Tambora, but also Lucky, uh, and uh, uh, one, one can see that air temperatures drop, and uh, the drop was highly important and significant <clears throat> in the case of the big volcanic eruptions, Laki and Tambora. There's no explanation 
on a volcanic uh, contribution in uh, about 1841-42, which was uh, another terrible year in Moscow and uh, uh, another year where uh, uh, the Nazis uh, army ha has been stopped outside of Moscow. <clears throat> the annual, uh, actually the mean temperatures at 10 European sites are shown here, uh, which have uh, long uh, records that they go back to 1750 and uh, there is a an indication of a longer term trend, but uh, the longer term trend uh, is uh, influenced by occasional and erratic changes shown by the arrows due to volcanic eruptions. The dust veil index that I mentioned before and the Aerosol optical depths can be seen in that slide quite clearly. Uh, <clears throat> uh, needless to say that the correlation is very high and one can see it by eye. And uh, moreover, wh what is clearly, very clear here are that, uh, it, uh, it, it is that this, uh, this AOD derived, as I said, from uh, red to green ratios um, is, uh, is, is so uh, coherent that can be seen by naked eye. Here are the comparison of all measurements using 800 paintings and uh, the results are valid and the same. There have been uh, several uh, 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 journalists who were interested in our work and they keep on doing some. Uh, we have uh, also checked uh, on the monks uh, uh, screen and uh, uh, actually, we found out that the, 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 um, uh, the, the red to green ratio there corresponded indeed for, to the Krakatau uh, eruption, giving similar red to green ratios. And uh, we have uh, actually uh, sent to the curator of one of the monks uh, galleries and uh, he, he said that by with other methods they could verify that uh, that particular painting was painted after the Krakatau eruption. So to summarize, because I'm sorry, I, I, it took some time to fix the, the presentation. To, to summarize, I think it would be uh, good to remember that uh, the, the brain of, of the great uh, colorists looks rather at uh, uh, ratios rather than colors themselves, although they are using colors. It turned out in our study that uh, the blue was not crucial in uh, uh, the results that we arrived at, but the red to green was the crucial finding. And uh, it could be that the brain is operating, maybe of everyone, not only of the great masters is operating as a detector of aerosols overhead. This gives uh, a link and a clue, not only be between volcanic eruptions and uh, climate, but also in society. 
it brings a clue that uh, the phenomena, the post volcanic phenomena. And uh, a few weeks ago, for instance, in uh, Southern Europe, uh, as you know, we experienced one of those uh, uh, Saharan dust um, uh, clouds. And it was amazing because even without using any particular uh, instrument, uh, most people that walked on, uh, on the streets uh, realized that the, the, the sky was totally different from the, the colors were totally different from the, the, the usual uh, ones. So, for instance, uh, I'm based in southern Portugal and we experienced a couple of days of uh, yellowish uh, sky. It was like we were on Mars, kind of a uh, kind of uh, Alienation uh, experience. So I don't know if you want to add something about it. Yeah, sure. You know, there is no color and no combination of colors, particularly ratios that does not have, you know, its origin in a phenomenon. So, uh, of course, the Saharan dust uh, period starts um, in, in, in spring and uh, it uh, transports uh, Saharan dust to large distances and change the, the, the ratio of the colors. Uh, similarly, of course, volcanic eruptions can do the same thing, but it's more global. Uh, while the Saharan dust affects mostly uh, middle to southern Europe. So uh, in, uh, in the Arab world, uh, the, 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 this period uh, and these uh, winds which uh, blow and uh, rise the sun the sun the, to to the air you know mm -hmm. uh, they are called in, in Arabic hamsin and uh, the, that uh, that word means uh, uh, 50 uh, and so they are expecting during the Ramadan which uh, started a few days ago during the feast for Muslim uh, believers uh, that uh, <clears throat> there are 50 days uh, where you have uh, uh, these, uh, these winds from Sahara. Uh, they are created uh, when uh, there is low pressure system passing over Sahara and uh, it is, uh, they transport the winds. They are quite strong. Uh, at, at times, uh, these uh, Hamsin uh, winds, uh, uh, they, they can get uh, even gale force and uh, they, they, they can uh, uh, introduce, you know, hazard to the caravans and to those who are uh, transporting in, in the Sahara. So the, that uh, event, I think uh, we, we should look at it from uh, through Modis, maybe we can see the colors. And uh, yeah, if, if you have pictures, I, 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 I would uh, like to get the ratios. You know, they are all digital now, so you can get the red to green ratio and, um, and uh, tell you what the aerosol, the AOD uh, was in that passage. Otherwise, you know, uh, uh, regularly, day and uh, evening are distinguished by the change of these ratios of the colors red to green. Thank you. Yeah, it seems a, a nice project to, to start with, uh, with our students at school. So taking pictures in different days at the same hour yeah. and comparing them. Uh, I'll be happy and uh, my colleagues here, we, we can uh, create a little amusement uh, and uh, artful <laughs> little project for young people because they, they love these things, you know. If, if you give them some paintings and some music, they will love you. I, I know from my own students, so <laughs> they, they love these things. And uh, so we, we, we can create something like a rubric in our, uh, intervals of uh, of heavier work you know uh, mm -hmm. 
and and uh, it, it would be quite good. I, I can uh, we can share our models, and uh, of course, uh, it, it's a good, very good idea. I, I fully agree with you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, as Phil is saying in the chat, it's a, a potential uh, cross Europe citizen project. So later mm -hmm. in the in the in the session, uh, there will be a, a moment where uh, all the participants uh, will be able to, to share and uh, their experiences and who knows, uh, start uh, collaboration projects. And this is a, a really nice example of that. So there, are there any more questions? Yes, there is one from Francis. Okay. So we can give him can you help me, Phil? Making him, uh... yeah. If I can find him. Well, I have it. May I say? Yeah, yeah. Please go on. Yes, there is a question Thank from you. Francis Ludlow. Um, um, he says there is a very impressive match between the Dustville Index and the data from the paintings. Um, he noticed there was a period between uh, 1900 and 1950 when the co correlation seemed to diminish. So uh, Francis wonders um, um, if uh, the speaker can comment on that. Yeah, uh, we, we have seen also that it's it not, not completely diminished, but uh, reduced. Uh, I, I would say that uh, maybe the way of uh, presenting colors, you know, in more recent paintings, in view of the change from impressionism to, to more modern art, maybe this must have had uh, an influence in the red to green ratios, but it's a very good comment. I think we, we need to work on, on it, uh, but like all of you, <laughs> I'm also a busy person and uh, I, I would love to do these things, you know, really I love them. Costas knows me very well for a hundred years now. He's not a hundred years old, I am. Uh, so <laughs> <coughs> yeah, we, we have to, to revisit the issue, I'm sure. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. So Costas, you have your hand raised. Do you have any question? Yes, I would well. like to make a question uh, because uh, um, I know uh, you're interested in music. So I would like to ask, uh, did the past climate have any influence on music or instrument making? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Costas. Well, um, yeah, um, it, it, it does, it does. Uh, I could, uh, well, I don't have the music now to, to play it for you, but uh, uh, we all know the seasons. For the seasons, but mo mostly we know Vivaldi's seasons that have been written in Venice in 1700, you know. So, but there are the seasons by Haydn. There are the seasons written by Tchaikovsky for piano. And uh, there are the seasons in uh, Buenos Aires written by Piazzolla. So if you compare the seasons, for instance, if you take, um, Spring, we are now in spring. Uh, you can see the difference between the Venetian period of, uh, of Renaissance, Vivaldi. This is Vivaldi. And you move to Buenos Aires 200 years after. Then you get the the equivalent spring for Piazzolla, which is a heavy and really um, impulsive tango. 
that is uh, representing spring, which is uh, uh, one has the joy of going back to nature, Vivaldi, and uh, Piazzolla uh, has actually um, the, the sense of uh, deep feelings and uh, uh, more, uh, how to say, uh, very deep sentiments uh, that were in the, in the Belle Epoque period of uh, Piazzolla. If you go to more recent tangos, you'll see that the tangos have been influenced by another type of music, uh, actually the Brazilian rhythms, and uh, it's a mixture of everything. So you can compare music for as long as it is classical. Uh, you cannot go beyond Piazzolla, it's, uh, I think. But if you compare Haydn, for instance, uh, he, he wrote that beautiful oratorio with the four seasons and uh, they last, uh, the oratorio lasts for an hour. So if you, if you take, uh, you know, uh, 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 parts from the springtime, you, you'll be amazed to see the, the middle ages influence or the beginning of, of the classical music era which is more symphonic, more Bachian. Bach had influenced them all. And uh, it is, uh, you can differentiate that with the music by Vivaldi. To summarize, yes, you can see changes and differences in music according to climate. You can see different music, different vocals, uh, different heat in the uh, in the soul of, of of the composers, the early ones as they as you compare them with the recent ones, uh, but definitely after World War II things have changed uh, radically. Thank you. Thank you. So we still have another question. Uh, Stephen Michael from the US. He, he asks, "Oh well." do photographs uh, represent uh, live colors uh, we see? So he, he says that uh, his own photographs never look as good as the actual images uh, of uh, the sunset. Yeah, except if they are by expensive <laughs> cameras taken, you know, like uh, an icon, an expensive icon, in our case, and, or a hazard blood which, which are, where are they, they, they are professional cameras. But uh, I agree that uh, no, no picture can give you the essence uh, and the beauty of a real uh, colorist or a, a real master work. You know, it's, uh, it's obvious. Th that is why they are so expensive, you know. <laughs> I think it's the same phenomena with the um with the auroras. So the images, uh, the pictures we see from the auroras, and if you see them uh, with your naked eye, it's a totally different experience. Uh, absolutely. You know why? Because you have to incline your head and uh, you are pushing your nerves there. So uh, by inclining that, you, you, you start having something um, Celestial, you have an influence that comes from above. Um, if, if you see the, the, the Athens school, so-called, uh, in the Vatican, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, 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 the painter is showing Plato, showing up in the ideas coming from the God, you know. And, uh, and Aristotle is next to him and he's, uh, pointing to the earth, he's, he's grounded and he, mm -hmm. he, he's looking at phenomena, uh, probably at experiments. But uh, both are going side by side and this shows that even the, the um, um, heavenly things that Plato was thinking 
together with the experiments that we are doing, they, they could match and go together. And then in that uh, painting, uh, as you know, uh, is um, the, the, it shows most of the philosophers from different uh, areas. Uh, it has Avicen, it has uh, Arabian philosophers, Persian philosophers, Chinese. It's a wonderful mixture of, 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 of the humankind and the wisdom of the humans. So th th this, th th this is how science and art uh, match together. In, in, I think the paintings and the music, of course, they do a, a beautiful job and uh, a joyful to us because we have been always calculating. I know you, you ladies and guys, we have all <laughs> been doing that work. Uh, as I said before, I have been doing it for a hundred years and uh, uh, you know, making a break <laughs> to art before or for art, it's a good thing. You, you, you feel better after that, you know. <laughs> I totally agree. Yeah, it's like, um, it's the same like going uh, into the forest or into the wild. And yeah, the contact you, with nature. you get this, the smelling. The smelling yeah. is also aerosols. <laughs> so you can use your smelling and uh, calculate aerosols. I don't know how you can parameterize that, but uh, probably there must be some way. <laughs> And to summarize, uh, Stephen, it seems that you have to buy a, a better camera. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, we will do that. <laughs> Not at the moment because the crisis of oil, you know, <laughs> and all, all this, you know, it's amazing. We have a climate crisis, we have the pandemic crisis, we have a war, we have economic crisis, and I don't know what hell other thing will come, you know. It's, mm. it's, it, we are in a very peculiar period um, of, of humanity. Mm. I'm so sorry that the younger are losing the opportunity to getting together. And uh, they are all, they, they are stuck, you know, behind their screens and uh, everything is virtual. You, you will see marriages, virtual marriages soon. Mm. So they don't know each other. They have never touched each other, and they 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 go to get married. You know, it's it's a possibility, crazy, but could could happen in in this crazy world that we live. Yeah, that's true. The advantages and disadvantages of technology. Luckily for us, uh, this virtual workshop, it's only possible thanks to the technology. So I don't see any, any other question. Does anyone want to <laughs> take the opportunity of having Christos with us? Yeah, if I could just ask one final uh, yeah, question. I, um, yes. Yeah, as, as I said, um, to you before, I think my students love this material and uh, they're amazed that they can get that you can get this scientific data out of this source. Um, and at first, they almost don't believe it. But as you're, you know, as you go through your work and you show them the charts, they start to believe it. And, it, and it's real because I, I teach history students as um, it makes them look at these these sources completely differently. So mm -hmm. it's really great. Um, but I just wonder how, how you deal with uh, dirt on the canvases or and um, because I've seen sometimes when there's been a cleaning of a, of a famous painting, it looks quite different after it's been cleaned versus before and uh, how that might affect the, the, the values yes. that you get from. Uh, well, thank you, Phil. That's a very good uh, question. And uh, we have uh, tested that with the curators at the National Gallery in London and uh, in our gallery in Athens. And it, it, it turns out that the aging of the colors, uh, it's a, it, it, it every color deteriorates roughly with the at the same rate. For instance, red and green, they deteriorate together. So the ratio is not really affected so much. Uh, we have tested by 
doing calculations in the first period of paintings, for instance, before 1700 or before 1750. And we compared with paintings early uh, in, uh, in the 20th century. For instance, Monet, Manet, you know, and uh, we, we got uh, uh, similar answers in the ratios after the volcanic eruption. The, the volcanic eruptions are so great. Uh, I mean, the big ones, of course, uh, the, uh, you know, the magnitude to be about four or five. You know. uh, uh, we, we, we had a, a, a wonderful case now with that crazy eruption in, uh, in the ring of fire, you know, that uh, it was ejected 30 kilometers, uh, uh, one tenth of an island, uh, fairly large island, which is crazy. And um, I think it's an opportunity every time we get such large volcanoes, volcanic eruptions above uh, magnitude of four, everyone could go out and uh, let's, 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 uh, let, let's do what Helter said. I mean, we, we could, we could make a, li a little club. You know, there was a club uh, 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 200 years ago, uh, 300 years ago, there was a, a club in London called the Club of the Dilettani. They were famous people, very rich, and uh, they were they wanted to travel and organize travel excursions and produce books, beautiful books with paintings, you know, and engravings, etc. So these Dilettani uh, gave us lots of information on the on the history of the Mediterranean, for instance, uh, and uh, other histories. So why not uh, create um, a, uh, something uh, may, maybe uh, like you and myself and uh, Helder and maybe Costas and others. We can create a, not, a, not to call it dilettani, a volcanic uh, something, um, vo vo volcano lovers, or <laughs> uh, you know, um, uh, and 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 uh, see if we can. Every time we have a volcano, let's join in our forces, like we did to to uh, explain the ozone hole, like we did to uh, measure other measurements, like the. Chernobyl dispersion of uh, radioactive material. Uh, I remember uh, I got hundreds of calls from colleagues, let's measure that, let's look at the other and get in contact with the local nuclear people to collaborate and uh, do back trajectories and see how many went back to Chernobyl and, and so on. So, uh, same way we can do it uh, now. Why not? It's a it's a good exercise, and uh, the students will be looking for you know uh, eruptions. Why not? It's an expectation. Expectation is always a nice thing because it gives you always happy that you will meet with your future. You know, so it's it's a it's a nice uh, sentiment to the people. Yeah, love to talk about us. Yeah, thank, thank you. Me too. Thank you so much. Okay. So I think we are a, a little bit behind of schedule, but anyway, uh, as there are no further questions, no more questions, I think we can uh, make a, a break and uh, give a big round of applause to, to Christos. To all of you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. So welcome again, everyone. Um, we already have with us um, the next uh, uh, presenter. So uh, we are pleased to, to welcome you, Richard. Richie. Richie, Will Richie Williams is a um, uh, scientist based on, uh, on the US, but actually has traveled 
a lot of times to Iceland. And uh, so it will be a, a good way of um, ending our uh, workshop uh, with another uh, trip to, to a paradise for geologists, Iceland, the land of ice and fire. So the stage is yours. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Richie. Okay, well, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. I can't see you, but I can, uh, I know you're there. Anyway, today I'm gonna talk about uh, the natural hazards faced by Icelanders when they first settled uh, Iceland and um, up to the present time. And of course, in some ways I'm building on one of the worst hazards that they had to deal with is volcanism and particularly the lecture that you heard yesterday from Katrin Kleeman about the Laki or the Skaft the Elder uh, volcanic eruption in 1783. And I'll just mention that briefly because I'm sure she covered it well. Anyway, why don't we start with the beginning in terms of Iceland. Um, Iceland uh, was settled essentially around 870. Uh, some of these uh, years are not quite correct. The, the Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland, and Newfoundland and what have you, uh, the, the Norse adventurers and, uh, began to range out in the late part of the eighth century to the west. And of course, the first place that was settled after from Norway and the Hebrides, the Shetlands, uh, the um, Ireland, the Isle of Man were the Faroe Islands. And then uh, by chance, uh, not by design, because they didn't really know what was to the west, uh, Iceland came next. And Iceland was a real find. And in, from a historical standpoint, it's quite amazing. There were no people there. There may have been a couple of Irish monks or so, but as soon as they saw the Vikings arrive, uh, they decided they'd go somewhere else. But anyway, they came to a land that was about uh, twice, the, half, uh, half the size of France, a little bit bigger than Switzerland and Austria, 103,000 square kilometers. Um, and of course, they were traveling across the ocean from Europe. And uh, of course, they didn't know what was underneath the ocean. They don't, didn't know anything about Iceland. And uh, so that's the story that it begins when they first land on Iceland. And uh, they were going to have to confront things they had never seen before. Here is the, here, is the, uh, here they go across uh, from the Faroe Islands. They're striking out to find other islands. And here they hit Iceland. Iceland sits on an insular platform, uh, but more importantly, it sits right astride the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which we'll uh, cover just briefly. But this is the center because of the Wyvil Thompson Ridge that goes across from Greenland to Iceland to the Faroes. This is an area of weakness in the Earth's crust, and it just for 13 million years or more, uh, it has been volcanically active and expanding. Uh, so this is, they didn't know this. They're traveling on ocean water. They don't know what's underneath them, but they're soon to find out. Um, the types of ships that the explorers used were these uh, long ships. Um, I think you can see the, maybe the captain is pointing off to the west and we'll, we'll assume that's Iceland, but these ships were very uh, flexible. They could handle waves quite well. They did a lot of bailing. And off to the right, you'll see another thing that we're going to talk about, not icebergs per se, but ice, glaciers and ice. And of course, these people that came from Norway were quite familiar with glaciers. And in fact, they brought the name Jukic or, or glacier in Icelandic is, uh, is almost all the glaciers have that name uh, preceded by a descriptive term, as you shall see. But they certainly knew what glaciers were. Anyway, here they are pointing to perhaps new land. Uh, of course, they didn't stop there. Uh, around uh, uh, late 1800s and what have you, they kept going and they formed two colonies in Greenland and then came down Hetland and Markland and Newfound uh, Vinland. And as far one of my colleagues in Iceland said, they went as far as uh, the, the, the harbor of what we call now New York. 
And um, this is one of his maps that he drew showing the root of Thor Finner, Carl Sefnick. Okay, the longboat was not an appropriate ship uh, to haul people and animals, uh, farm animals and other supplies. So the Knorr was the type of ship that was used to transport people and animals and um, supplies when they first settled Iceland. And so much sturdier, broader in beam and uh, a quite useful vessel. Now, when the early adventures came to Iceland and they must have made several visits, but no, they didn't settle it right away. But one of the reports that came back that there was ice in the, if you look at this map in the upper left-hand corner, there was quite a bit of sea ice that came into the fjords there. In fact, the fjord is called Isafjord, uh, Isafjord or Icefjord, sea ice coming from Greenland. And so that's how it got its name, Iceland. But what he didn't realize was, if you look on this map, you can see all the green areas. There were plenty of meadowlands that uh, were in valleys coming up from the sea. Uh, the whole interior of Iceland, unfortunately, um, you know, in terms of settlement pattern, had huge deserts like Oda the Rhein here in the northeast um, and here. But it's the green areas that were settled first, particularly in the north. And uh, they had ex one guy reported back that the, there was so much grass and the grass was dripping with butter. And here I took a picture of one of the meadows in Iceland. And with those yellow flowers, it sure looks like it's dripping with butter. So that's what to to took hold. And they decided to go and settle it en masse. And within 50 years, from, uh, from about 870 to 920, all of Iceland was settled. Now, fortunately, we have a, um, we have a, a, a book that's been translated, and this one happens to be translated into English, it's called La Nama Book. And that's a land naming book. And they, um, one of my friends is uh, Gil Vimar Guthbergson, no longer with us, he, he did the maps for the back showing where these uh, settlers ended up. Now this is on the south coast. And if we look down here to the bottom left, you see the Vestman Islands or Vestman Air, um, which will be in, which I'll talk about later in the uh, volcanic part of this. This is a two-part presentation of volcan volcanism and uh, glac glaciers. Uh, but we're, they we're gonna come back to this area several times. Here you have uh, the Skaftau, or the Skaftau River. Uh, that's one of the passages that the great Lockheed eruption, one of the great tongues that came down from the eruption over here, the Fisher eruption that came down onto the coastal plain. Every one of these places shows where people settled. Uh, this one was settled by Sigvath the Red or Harappan the Foolish. They always, they tended to have nicknames for people. We still that, do that today. Uh, it, the, the largest glacier we see here is Myrdalsjökull, and it has enormous caldera on it, and it produces the worst Yukaloips or glacier outburst floods that have happened historically. And then this uh, other ice cap sitting to the left here is Eyjafjallajökull, and that was active uh, not very long ago and stopped a lot of transatlantic travel. And then we'll talk later on about Heime and also Surtsey, uh, two volcanic eruptions I was at during their, uh, and then of course you have Hecla up here. These are all very famous geographic locations for volcanism. And you can see the whole area, this green area over here, which is brown, but on the other map, it showed, here's Kettle, one hand, probably lost the other one in a sword fight. Uh, but these are all of the farmsteads of the people that settled in the beginning. Uh, one thing they had to deal with, I mean, aside from the volcanism and the um, uh, glaciation and floods, we're going to mainly talk about uh, volcanism and floods related to volcanism, was he had a variability of temperature. This was put together by Thorvald or Thorudson one of the uh, geologists from the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century. 
He put together this based on shipping records, how much sea ice there was. The blue is the colder periods, the red is the warmer periods. It's this stopped around, um, well, 1971, of course, it's been getting warmer and warmer. So this red on the right should keep going up. But you can see they had a the little ice age here that they would have had to contend with. The other thing that was very devastating in Iceland were when sailors would arrive bringing, among other things, smallpox. So you would have waves of smallpox would go through the island. So it was very difficult to increase population because of the loss of lives during, during uh, uh, sickness of various uh, diseases. But anyway, they prevailed and it continued on. Here is what they didn't know. Uh, this is a, a modern map, a geologic map of Iceland, and we have the, the Reykjanes Ridge coming up the mid-Atlantic onshore. We have the western volcanic zone, the eastern volcanic zone, the northern volcanic zone. It was the eastern volcanic zone that we're mainly going to talk about today, because not only is that's where a lot of volcanism has occurred, there's also had the ice caps of Myrdalsjökull, Eyjafjallajökull, and Vatnajökull, the big ice cap, where volcanism takes place under the ice and produces enormous floods. Uh, but this is the best knowledge we have today. This is the mid-Iceland mid, mid, uh, volcanic zones, the tertiary rocks, the earlier rocks are on the outside, and this whole area is spreading apart a couple of centimeters a year. And we'll talk about some of the volcanic activity briefly. And of course, uh, those of you who are familiar with Icelandic uh, history, Sigurd Thorarnson, who I worked with, and a lot of European geologists and students and everybody, a wonderful human being, Sigurd Thorarnson, one of his more famous series of lectures in England was the thousand year struggle against ice and fire. And that's sort of where the ice and fire or fire and ice concept came. And so he did a lot of writings and a lot of publishing and a lot of research on ice and fire. He's also the one who coined the term tephra, which is from a Greek word, and it means all airborne material and irrespective of its size. So I'll often refer to tephra and in a way you can convert it to ash, but remember it's talking about things as big as blocks to very fine, fine grain material. Uh, he also determined that we have about uh, one volcanic eruption in Iceland every uh, five years, sometimes more often than that, as we have been having in the recent times. Uh, so it's an extremely active area for 100,000 square kilometers. The, one of their most famous volcanoes that's lent its name, this is Stjeldbreder, or bro uh, uh, Broad Shield. It's given its name to all the lava shields in the world. Then uh, another famous Icelandic volcano, other than Hekla, is Snæfellsjökull, and this is where the Jules Verne's a great uh, sci-fi story, uh, Voyage au Centre de la Terre, took place, and it's been made into movies three or four times. But and tourists still go to Iceland to climb to the summit here to see, see the entrance to uh, to the, uh, the the novel. Of course, they ended up in Etna, uh, Italy, at the end of the story. But this is a beautiful stratovolcano uh, that you can see from Reykjavik on a clear day. And then, of course, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, uh, Katrin Kleeman has been doing a lot of research on the Lockheed eruption, Skafta Eldar in Icelandic. Um, there have been books after books written about Lockheed, so it's going to be fun to see her book, which is uh, expected to be released by the publisher in November or December of this year. Um, it's an extraordinary story, as this uh, subtitle says here. This was one written by a woman that works with Science News, um, and it did a really good job with this book, Iceland on Fire. 
Uh, this I'm sure you saw yesterday from Katrin. This is an area that was covered by about 580 square kilometers, the largest volcanic eruption in terms of lava flows in history, uh, uh, in historical eruptions. It still holds the record for that. The second one in Iceland, actually, we'll see in, in a few minutes. Uh, but here's where the there were two major arms, Lakagiger. Uh, crater row. There are about 130 craters along this row, filled out around it, and then spilled down these two two valleys. One, the Skaftau River, and the Krefisflut, out onto the coastal plain. And this little tongue. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right smack in the bottom center near Kirkjubar Cloister, there was a church, and that's where Jon Steingrimson, the the pastor of the church. Um, offered many prayers, and, and of course, uh, the lava didn't quite get to the church, which was good for, in both uh, places. And, uh, but he wrote about it, and he was, uh, had a, a front row seat, so to speak. And so his narrative of the eruption is also available and translated uh, and available for reading. This is what it would have looked like. This happened. This is an oblique aerial photograph from northern Iceland from the Krapla eruptions, where you would have a whole fissure open up with lava fountains and streams and streams of lava pouring out onto the countryside and seeking the lowest areas. So the lava will flow in, in liquid. As a liquid, it'll crust over, but underneath it still keeps moving. Uh, lava fountains will often produce a lot of uh, particulate matter in the air, producing tephra. Uh, this was the first uh, image that was taken with Landsat in 1972. Uh, we have Myrda's Yerkel here. We have Katla Yerkel, where big, uh, enormous outburst floods come from, which you'll see in a minute. Eyjafatla Yerkel, where the one that stopped the air, air traffic. Uh, Vatniokel is over here underneath the clouds. This is a very large caldera up here called uh, Torfajökull, And then we're going out here under the coastal plain. This was where some of the settlers uh, put in farms and what have you, which was not a good idea in retrospect. Because when the Katla, the, the one in the, in 1917, when that erupted underneath the Katla eruption under this one, produced a flood that was estimated to be higher than 200,000 cubic meters per second for several hours. That exceeds the flow of the, of the normal flow of the largest river on the planet Earth, the uh, Amazon River. So there was that torrent, unbelievable torrent of water pouring out from underneath Kotlyokal and covering this huge area, which you see in blue. This map was produced by Guthrun Larsen, who worked closely with Sigurdur Thuraronsen. And these are all the areas that went underwater, including many farmsteads, which are marked by red circles uh, where damage took place. This, excuse me, it was 1918, not 17. Uh, then, of course, there's Hecla and uh, Guthbrander Thurlaxen working with uh, Abraham's Ortelius. This map was produced in 1590. You see Hecla here, all these clots of lava going in the air are considered to be the souls of those from hell that were trying to escape. So Hecla is this perpetually damned. Uh, Hecla was thought to be one of the entrances to hell. On the bottom, you have Myrdas Yerkel, you have Solheim Yerkel, which is one of the outlet glaciers of Myrdas Yerkel and Eyjafatla Yerkel. And they, we just talked about Myrdas Yerkel because of the great outburst floods. Eyjafatla Yerkel, um, uh, we will talk about a little bit later. And then this was the whole, here's the Skaftau, and this is where the lava flows came out in 1783 and to early 1784. There is no Glacier, the biggest glacier in Iceland, um, Vatniokel, is not shown on this map and wasn't shown on any maps for a very long time. Uh, part of the problem was you have to go across a very large um, outwash plain to get to the other side. It just, the Icelanders knew it was there, but the map makers didn't. 
This is Iceland's probably most famous volcano, Hekla. I've been to the top and taken temperature measurements at the top. There's a long fissure at the top of Hekla. This erupts periodically and lava flows come down the slopes or you have flank eruptions that go out onto the, onto the area around it. Um, fortunately, most of the big lava eruptions have not done that much damage. It's mainly the explosive eruptions that have caused the biggest problem. Although in, 18, in 1947, Hecla produced enough tephra to cover the land that about 7,000 sheep died from fluorosis po poisoning, eating grass that was covered with these particles that were highly uh, uh, contaminated with uh, fluorine. Uh, but in typical Icelandic style, they were all the farmers were reimbursed for their loss so that they could start again. Not the insurance companies didn't do it, the parliament. Uh, rec uh, repaid the farmers for their loss. And this is the same pattern that's happened many times in Iceland, including Heimei, uh, when the houses were lost there and the insurance uh, wouldn't cover them. Um, or they, uh, uh, they didn't have money to rebuild. The people of Iceland put a surtax on themselves the next year through the parliament and everybody was reimbursed for their loss. So I think Iceland has a lot to tell us about what you should do when you have a terrible disaster. Here was a, a 1947 when Hecla was in full eruption and the clouds that you see shooting straight up and uh, were depositing tephra in downwind, whatever way the wind was blowing, you would have the deposition of, of, of tephra or ash um, and on the left-hand side here, you can see lava flows coming down the slope. Now we'll switch our attention to more recent activity. Here's Eyjafjallajökull with its small caldera at the top. Um, this is Gigjökull, where a, a Jökulloip occurred, came out onto market float and came down here. And uh, most of our uh, science or our what well, should call TV presenters. They finally gave up trying to say, yeah, yeah, finally you could, and just said, oh, that volcano. Anyway, this volcano affected a lot of the farmsteads around here. Um, and then in 1963, Surtsey erupted, we'll show you that. And then uh, Heime erupted 10 years later uh, in January, 1973. Uh, here's a picture um, some years after Surtsey had finished erupting. Um, it has this lava cap on the, the western part of it. Here you have tephra, which is now hardened into tuff. Um, been on the island twice, once by boat and once by helicopter on temperature measurements, and was there during the eruption in 1966 when we landed by boat over here on the coast from Heime. Surtsey was a really interesting volcano because it was all submarine um, until it reached the surface. And then it produced three other islands, Surtla, which never broke through the ocean surface, Surtlinger, which became a tephra island, but because it never had a lava cap, never was, became permanent, it was washed away. And then down here in the southwest uh, part offshore was Yolnir or Christmas Island, and that you'll see in a few minutes. I have one of the last pictures taken of it before it washed away. Um, and there were two major eruptive centers on Surtsey, the first one and the second one. And this is the second one I was there with when the crater row formed. We'll see that in a sec. This is Yolnir. This would have been the same with Surtlinger. Surtlinger looks similar in that it, it breached the ocean surface, produced an island, didn't produce any lava, and so it was washed away. Um, this lasted from Christmas until um, the Christmas, let's see, that would have been 1965 till about uh, July of, of 66, it was active. 
Uh, here it is on uh, in August. I was in a in an airplane taking uh, photographs, an oblique photograph here, looking back on the three uh, <clears throat> craters in a, in a Fisher row here. In the second crater, the other big craters over here with the uh, hardened tephra behind. This is all lava flows. Here are new lava flows entering the sea. You can see the steam rising as the lava reaches the sea. Oftentimes, the lava will not be flowing on the surface, but subsurface in lava tubes that then reach the ocean. And in the background here, we see Yolnir. We see the cone that formed in, during the last stages of the eruption. And here's a view I took from the ridge. Um, I was standing right on this ridge here, looking off in this direction across the erupting craters toward Yolnir. And this one is vigorous. The second one and the third one looks like it's beginning to stop. But there's plenty of lava pouring out of the major crater um, and going into the sea. And in the background, you see it almost looks like a, 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 a Air Force fighter jet in the background, but it isn't. This is the cone of the of the uh, the crater that was erupting that we just saw. Whoops, I missed that one. Whoops, I guess we're switching to uh, Heimei. Okay, so the people on Heimei could see the eruption going on in the background. Um, to the southwest and said, well, it's a good thing it's going on there. Little did they know that uh, 10 years later, in January 1973, an, a fissure opened up on Heime to the east and uh, had huge lava fountains and uh, lava pouring out of the fissure. One of the, one of the farmer, one of the people that lived there got up, heard the rumbling, got up and looked out the window and said, then woke our husband up and said, oh, oh, you must call the fire department. And he took one look at it and he said, it's going to take more than a fire department to deal with that one. And so then the evacuations began because nobody knew how bad it was going to become. As it turned out, the lava flows uh, probably destroyed a third of the town of Esmenaire, has the same name as the archipelago. The island is called Heime or Home Island. And it was a very prosperous place because it was uh, produced about a third of the export fisheries, particularly the codfish that went to England for fish and chips. And so these houses are fairly substantial. These are not, uh, these are nice homes. And um, also the tephra is falling in tremendous volumes and covering the houses. And of course, if it gets too thick, it'll bury the house. And then if it rains on top of the tephra, then the roof will collapse. And we'll see that in a minute. Here's, here's uh, lava in the background. And then in front of it is where houses are covered with tephra. You can still see the tephra steaming from the hot uh, lava and tephra underneath. And these are the houses that are partially covered or fully covered in some cases with tephra. So this was a problem that would have to eventually be dealt with. There was one positive aspect, and that is the lava flows went to the north, but they did not close off the main harbor, but actually made the harbor better. So in the long run, it worked out OK. And again, as I told you, the Icelandic the parliament and the people in Iceland um, got together and compensated all these people. The houses were dug out where they could and uh, restored, as you shall see. Um, the ones that were crushed by the lava, of course, were total losses. So they be, it took a lot of the tephra from here, put it on the west side of the island, and then built a whole new uh, part of the town to the west. Uh, so if you go to Vestman Air now, and you can take, a, uh, during the summer months, you can take a ferry from the south coast and get there in about 30 minutes. Um, you can see where the lava flows are, and you can see the new parts of the town, and it's uh, pretty much restored. Unfortunately, as you hear, here's a real, I took this picture as we were taken off from the airport. You're seeing the main part of Vestmanair. You can see the port in the background, 
at some of the uh, boats. Uh, here's the harbor entrance, and you can see where the lava stopped about here. And the reason to stop there was that early on, they started pouring water with hoses onto the lava flow to try to chill it. And this is a response of the Icelanders to one of their hazards. They poured water on it and succeeded in slowing it down enough. It did not go into the harbor except along the edge here. And then it came in here between these two fish packing plants and stopped right there. If you can see the cursor I'm moving, I'll show you a ground picture in a minute. All the tephra here, they've taken it off the roofs and they're scraping it up and taking it over to the western part of the island. And this big building you see in the bottom is the hospital. And thank goodness, the lava never got to the hospital. So that, that stayed intact. Here's the lava flow I said that came into the, path, uh, the fish packing plants. It really didn't damage them at all. And when I went back a year later, all of this was gone. It had all been re removed by front end loaders because uh, it's all, they call it an apple groin or an ah uh -uh lava, uh, the term used in Hawaii. It's just blocks of lava. So it can be scooped up and taken away. Um, so th this was all cleaned up. Unfortunately, some of the houses, this one probably burned from uh, air, airborne um, incandescent lava, probably torched this uh, house, or it could have just collapsed from the too much ash on it. Anyway, this looks like it's a total loss. And you say, oh, brother, that's too bad. Um, but look what happened. There it is now. It's the same house, the, the chimney. There's the chimney, you can see, it's still intact. And they, they put uh, rebuilt the house and uh, it's better than it ever was. So this is, this is the typical response of the Icelanders to dealing with the hazard that they have to live with is that they have financial ways of helping their citizens. And, they, and it's a, a story that we're all gonna have to live with with respect to Ukraine is that everybody's gonna to have to pitch in and help put the country back together when the, when the war is over. But it has to be a collective cooperative activity. You would never know that there was a volcanic eruption that happened on Hemi if you were standing right here with a nice road, a curbing, a sidewalk and nice homes with grass lawns, et cetera. Okay, well, then we come to uh, 2010. Um, I, I might say that on Heimei, the last time they had an eruption was in 6,000 years ago. So they weren't expecting another one. And when it occurred on Circe, they figured that was it for another 6,000 years. Well, that didn't work out too well. Anyway, this is 2010. This is Eyjafat Mayukul. This is one of the ice caps in Southern Iceland and they began to erupt. And this one hadn't erupted since um, the 1800s. And it was two phases of the eruption. The first was a effusive eruption where it was just lava flows to the east of this uh, crater. In between Mirdasjökull and Eyjafjallajökull, you had lava flows, but then it, sh it shifted and you had an explosive volcanic eruption from the crater on the top of Eyjafjallajökull. And it was pretty impressive. I wasn't there at the time. I've seen movies on it. The, the white clouds are steam, the dark clouds are tephra. And this farmstead, in, in, uh, which is on Route 1 on the south, when you drive by, you can look at it today. It looks like this now again, but this whole area was covered with tephra. Um, so that all had to be removed, but the grass came back and uh, it looks pretty good again. And there's actually where I'm standing, there's a little museum there that has, re, that has gone over the history of what happened to this farmstead from the 2010 election. And here is this, here's the plume of tephra that's coming from, this is a MODIS image, uh, a NASA uh, ESA uh, Terrasat, uh, there's two of them up there, and this one, it goes by uh, twice a day, 
And here is the plume of the tephra that's traveling to the south, right on the uh, main airline routes going between Europe and uh, North America. And so it was this continual uh, flow or ejection of <clears throat> uh, tephra that caused the airlines to stop flying until the eruption was over. Okay, we're back to an, an, an overview of Iceland. Again, you can see the green swatches. By the way, in the bottom left here is uh, Reykjavik. We'll have a better picture of that in a minute. Here is Keflavik. Uh, this is where the international airport is. It's about 40 kilometers from there into Reykjavik. This whole area is expanding around Reykjavik uh, as the population grows. When I was there in uh, 1966, the population was 180,000. The population now is uh, 345,000. And much of the growth is in the Reykjavik and surrounding area. The second largest city with only about 18,000 people is accurate to the north here. And then most of the other villages are expanded fishing villages around the uh, perimeter. So most of the population of Iceland lives in this area. Fortunately, you have good grasslands down here, good salmon fishing. Um, you have grasslands to the north and particularly north of the city. Um, here's Snipefold here on uh, uh, to the left here, where I showed you that. Um, but here's another volcanic eruption that's occurring in 2014 that suddenly appeared north of Vatniokl. So here, but fortunately, again, here we have no, nobody living anywhere nearby. The only problem this eruption caused that this, this, the winds were blowing from the west. So all of the noxious as, um, gases were flowing down here to Hutton, uh, which is the center of the lobster industry in Iceland. And that caused big problems for several weeks. Uh, now here is a, a Landsat OLI operational land imager of that same eruption that we saw in the MODIS image. Uh, the, uh, there are other images uh, from SPOT. They're higher resolution. Then, of course, there's commercial uh, that we've been seeing in Ukraine that are almost like aerial photographs for the quality of their resolution. But this shows the growth of this new lava flow north of Dingyirkut, which is an outlet glacier of, uh, of Avatniokl. Um, and you can see the hot areas, the lava glowing, and uh, it's covering a, a fairly covered, eventually covered about 80 square kilometers. And it was the second largest aerial lava, effusive lava in Iceland in history. And what was interesting about this is the whole thing began in Bartherbunga within the Vatniokl, northwestern Vatniokl in a large caldera. Then the earthquake sequence migrated underneath Dingyokl, right out of Dingyokl, and then out came the lava. Thank goodness. Because if it had erupted here, the lava would have gone, I mean, the water would have gone to the west, and that's where all their huge except for one, their huge hydropower plants are located. So the biggest threat to these uh, volcanic sub-glacier volcanic eruptions on the western part of Vatniokl is the potential impact on their hydropower generation. Uh, these two uh, calderas we, we described for the first time back in 19... Uh, 74, Sigurd the Thrarns and Christian Simonson, myself, because we could detect them on the Landsat imagery and including the Barther Bunga. Uh, now we're shifting to the southwest for the last of the uh, volcanic part of this, and then we'll switch to the floods briefly. This is, uh, here's where the airport is located to Keflavik. Here's Reykjanes, uh, Re Reykjavik. The, the town, Hafna Fjordr is a, a large sub, uh, and then uh, Mosfell's fate to the east is growing very rapidly. All of this is covered with historic lavas, <coughs> but most of it didn't affect anything. But the spread of the town of Reykjavik and Hafna Fjordr out into this area 
onto lava flows that have flown historically is not a good idea on the long run because the, for the first time in 600 years, a volcanic eruption occurred uh, right here in uh, um, Geldinga Dalir, and they sometimes called Fagerdalsfjert. And you, I'll show you a sequence of images. Uh, the technolo technological ability. Okay, again, as with the eruption uh, north of Vatnioko, we had clues that something was going to happen because uh, clusters, huge clusters of, uh, of earthquakes occurred right where the eruption eventually occurred. This is in December 1921. Then it erupted. And this was in a valley, or it's plural, Geldinga Dalir. And this is a typical spatter cone, uh, scoria cone of lava uh, splashing up and then coming out and spreading across the landscape. And then, of course, it became quite an attraction. If you look on this slide, you can see all these people, all Icelanders, maybe a few tourists that came in, they hiked up here and uh, see their newest volcano. Um, and you can see the lava flows coming out and spreading down into the valley, the lower it heads for the lowest areas. And this is a sequence of two Landsat 8 images. This is at one stage, a few months later, this was a much later stage. You can still see the main volcano erupting. You can see it's overtopping passes in and dropping into other valleys and flowing down these valleys. The main road, um, the southern road here, as you can see on the bottom, it didn't quite get there. There are a few farmsteads. There's one there. Uh, never got to them either. And the last is a map that uh, the Icelandic uh, touring society I uh, just got in the mail um, is the major pathways on a new map of, of Iceland of this area showing all the lava flows in orange and all the dashed lines are hiking trails if you wish to go and look at the um, at the lava. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to switch the last few minutes maybe five or ten minutes we're going to talk about uh, the glaciers. The biggest glacier is Vatnajökull to the bottom right. You have Hofsjökull, Longjökull. We've talked about Myrdalsjökull and Eyjafjallajökull. Um, whoops. The um, this uh up in the northwest. You have Snæfells uh, on the west, um, and then you have up in the north around Aku area. On both sides of the fjord, you have a lot, more than a hundred mountain glaciers. We have we've we've counted and documented about 380 different glaciers, including 14 ice caps, and we have about 470 glacier names now, including all the outlet glaciers uh, from the big ice caps like Vatnajökull, which has about 50 outlet glaciers, and uh, we have compiled all that into a map. We're on the third edition now. Uh, it was Otter Sigurdsson leading, myself, and Schooley Vikinson. Uh, and we produced the first definitive map of the glaciers of Iceland. Uh, the, the darker areas on Vatnajökull are parts of glaciers that surge forward periodically for reasons that we still don't have a perfect explanation of. Glaciers do surge. And this area on the southwestern part of Vatnajökull, I'm going to show you a surge. And that's another problem if they surge onto occupied land, which doesn't happen very often, but it has happened historically. And then we uh, started in the beginning of this work with Otter Sigurdsson. We translated from the old uh, Danish into English to make it more accessible. Uh, a 1795 manuscript or map uh, and manuscript that was produced by St. Paulson, who sent it to the Danish Natural History Society. They never published it because they said they ran out of money. Um, it was published late 1800s, partially in Norway, and then it was published uh, in Icelandic in 1945. 
by Yon Atherson. And then Otter and I got together and did an English translation with the original um, handwritten manuscript. So this is a really neat book. Con considering what was going on in uh, continental Europe at that time in terms of, and this was way before um, the, the theory of glaciation and everything was developed by Agassiz and other prominent uh, scientists in, in Europe. But because it was never published, Svein Paulson never really deserved the credit he deserved. Uh, this was the first map. It was done in 1710. Uh, Magnuson in um, the Outlet Glacier Solheim Yukel coming off of Myrtis Yukel and blocking this river here. Um, the blue areas you see on the map of Iceland, again, we're done with uh, uh, several ice, other Icelandic scientists, show all of the flooded areas that can be expected from volcanic eruptions under the glaciers. And of course, these areas here and here and here and to the north are the ones that are most vulnerable. Uh, here's Fat uh, Nyoko. You can see the great Grimsfontein caldera where a lot of these outburst floods event originate. You see uh, uh, other calderas for the first time on this land set image. Miras Yoko is down here. And it's this great flood outburst. Uh, this is where the outburst floods generally go across the Skedar Sander from underneath Skather Irkut, which I will show you now. Nope, before that, Uravayukul erupted in 1362. And Icelanders always tend to cluster their farmstead, not, not cluster their farmsteads, but have them independently located. But after the big uh, Yukulipes or glacier outburst floods from Uravayukul, these deposits from those floods are actually called glaciers. But you notice we have them in parentheses enough in quotation marks. These are really just glacier deposits. Uh, these are all the glacier deposits from these great outburst floods from Muravayukul. After that happened, the farmsteads decided they better all pack together between these paths of these Yukaloids to be safe. So that was a reaction of the Icelanders to protecting themselves from future outburst floods. It did occur again in the 1720s, uh, but no major flood since that time. Here I am on an expedition in the, uh, in the big Grimsfontein caldera, just to give you an idea of the size of these features we've been looking at. There is a Bombardier, uh, French, uh, French, excuse me, French Canadian company that makes these. Uh, uh, tracked vehicles that can go like the wind on the surface of the ice. And some of the uh, Icelanders were ski yoring, being pulled by ropes as it was traveling at a high speed. And I took this across the caldera bottom. What I'm standing on is a frozen lake underneath of which is water. And what happens is from geothermal activity or subglacial, this lake fills up and then eventually overtops the sill here, and then you get a Yukaloip coming down onto the outwash plain, Skather or Sander. You also have volcanic eruptions in other parts of the Vatniokal in which the water drains into here and then goes out, which is what happened in 1996. <clears throat> uh, the height of the, it says here, the height of Grimstrap is 1725 meters above sea level. And up here, there's an expedition hut uh, that was put together by the Icelandic uh, Glaciological Society that they use as a place to stay in, which I have at the top of the mountain. This was 1966. All of the brownish area you see here all went underwater. The bridge at uh, Kigyu uh, Kriesel, the bridge at Skedarau, all were washed away. So that the route of one across the Skedarar Sander was nipped in two places and many of the communication cables were also severed. So it took them a while to put that back together. Um, this was in 1937, was another one that occurred um, on this outwash plain. 
is a really early photo, oblique aerial photograph showing that the whole, again, all of Scather Asander, in the background, all the way from uh, here is all underwater. And this is 1996, either Sigurdsson took this photograph looking across the terminus of Skeidar Ayukut, and all, th this bridge went out here, and what you can't see in the distance, the other road bridge went out. This one was still intact, uh, but it caused an enormous amount of damage to put the road back together. These features you see are moraines from the past position of the front of this glacier. And then of course, the, the great floods come out, carry blocks of ice that are bigger than houses. Here's a person standing on the left here between two of the blocks. They've already begun to melt because they're getting rounded. Uh, but I was there right after this event and I couldn't believe the size of these ice blocks. And the other, the other problem with glaciers, not so much now, but in the past, is that when they advanced, they often would, well, they would overrun farmsteads. Um, and this is Breda Merkirjeker. And those of you who have been to Iceland may have gone here. Uh, they now, it's a major tourist attraction because they have duck boats. They call them duck boats that go out and go around the, the um, Yukul Sarlon, the, the lagoon here in front, so you can see icebergs on the front of the glacier close up. And there's a very short river underneath the suspension bridge that goes out into the North Atlantic Ocean. And many times you see blocks of ice on the beach. So you should take your camera if you go. But this is one of the largest, it's made up of four different glaciers that merged with the medial moraines in between. And you can see over here, this is a surge type glacier because the uh, tephra bands in the glacier are all uh, disturbed, which shows that this is a surge type glacier. Here's our four, this was done by the University of Glasgow. They have a maps from 1903, 45, 65, and 80. And the Brather Mercury Oakle at that time, at the turn of the century, the 1900 century, um, this glacier almost reached the North Atlantic Ocean. And since that time, it's been retreating and forming bigger and bigger proglacial lakes in front of them. Another problem is a surge type glacier like Yangiyeka. Uh, it can have glaciers. This outlet glacier is Hagafels Yokel Estri, has gone into, into Hagavatn and is now pushing the water up and out, uh, displacing the volume. You can see here it's entered the, the, the uh, uh, Hagavatn, and now this it's spilling out through this discharge, which I took a picture of. And you can see an enormous amounts of water are now coming out and heading out onto other parts of, uh, to the south of this, and, and some of it is farmland. Then the last couple of slides is uh, Otter managed to catch by chance a uh, surge wave coming across uh, Sidhuyukul or uh, Sidhuyukul on the southwestern part of Atniukul. And this is a wave of movement that goes through the ice and propels it forward and breaks the ice up into huge chunks. And I'm going to show you a picture he took of what the end, the margin, the normal margin of a glacier is fairly shallow. You can walk right up on it, but not this one, because the surge of the glacier came forward. Here's a person standing down here in the bottom left. Um, you can see the, the front of this glacier, which was flattered, flat before the surge, is now a jumbled mass. The last two slides, uh, this shows Iceland as it is today. Um, there's one island off the north, Grimsey. Um, you ha it has a fairly, really good, pay mostly paved around the perimeter, Route 1. And of course, all the, the cities and towns are paved roads. When I first went there, uh, the towns would have a paved road, but everything else was gravel. Uh, but Iceland has done a, a phenomenal job in uh, developing a, 
a really good road network around Iceland. And the last one is a technological achievement. <clears throat> the University of Minnesota in Iceland paired up with the Central Intelligence Agency to take um, stereo pairs of sat high resolution satellite images, convert them to through stereo photogrammetry into height models. And they've been mo modeling the Arctic and the Antarctic, the Arctic will focus on, including Iceland, where we now have a two meter digital data set of all of Iceland. And the reason this is important in glaciology is that over time, if you were to do this with these glaciers sinking, for instance, Vatniokul is melting so quickly that the, the fishing town of Hutton in the southeast, the whole bay is shallowing. So pretty soon they will have no way to get into the bay to anchor because it'll be dry land. It's called isostatic rebound of the crust as the ice is melting. But we'll be able to go over these ice masses with two meter uh, accuracy and show change in volume of the ice. And some of the features see on here on the left, far left is Sneifel's yokel. You see Myrda's yokel here, Eyjafjallajökull, yokel, the large glacier. Um, you can get this uh, from the uh, Geospatial Center at the University of Minnesota of all parts of the Arctic. Uh, I don't remember to what uh, latitude it goes down to, but these maps are, and these digital uh, terrain models are really fantastic for looking at details. Those of you who are interested in landforms and geomorphology and changes in land shape, uh, landforms, this is great. Uh, down here, we can see uh, Hofsjokel, um, excuse me, Hecla, and north of um, Thingvatlavatn, where the parliament met, is uh, Sneifef. So we begin to see these, these features quite, quite well with these digital terrain models. And I think that is the end. Yep. Oh, that's another... A view of another surge type glacier. You can see a person that just is. Uh, I wondered if I. Nope, I didn't. I thought I might have kept that other one. Okay, that's it. Um, hope you learned something from what I had to tell you. Hard to get feedback on a Zoom. Thank lecture. you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Richie, for this. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Brilliant presentation with a lot of imagery. Very, very interesting. So I'm pretty sure that the audience will have some questions. I just uh, shared the, the link uh, to the web page where uh, one can find these uh, digital elevation models that you Ah, mentioned. Good, good. Is that the one? The one? Yeah, PGC, correct. Yeah, very good. Um, so any questions you can use the chat or just ask us to open your microphone oh good i'm glad i got a one that uh, said it's good material to use in class, in that class I'm yeah. glad. If, you, if you want if you want the actual powerpoint i i phil smith is the technical the it expert for the the gift workshops um, I sent him the PDFs of each of the pictures that I used, but I also have it, of course, as a, uh, as a uh, PowerPoint presentation. And if you send me your um, email address, I can just pop that off through. There's a company called wetransfer.com, and it's easy for me to send the whole presentation so you have the slides to start with digitally. Thank you so much. So Inba is saying that uh, some aspects, some pictures reminds me, reminds her uh, La Palma eruption. So, yes, that's true. I have pictures of some of those houses that are completely covered. Now on uh, Cumbre Vieja, on uh, East La Palma, in the Canary Islands. Yeah. So. Well, I, I, I appreciate the comments you're making. I mean, in a, 
uh, visual presentation I focus on. I'm working on a book now for all the, but it's going to have a lot more background information. Oop, la cumbre vieja, right? Cumbre vieja. So as you, we used to say, uh, an image uh, speaks for itself. So it seems that uh, everyone is uh, amazed by the quality of your presentation. Well, I, I appreciate that. So just before I have a question, so if uh, I will give some extra time so other people can uh, think about any questions. Uh, just before you started your presentation, we were talking a little bit, and uh, you said that uh, you are involved in a project uh, why, when you, where you are using uh, data to compare digital data to compare the elevation models of the volcanoes in Iceland with the ones on Mars. If you want to share something about. Well, actually, what I'm, yeah, what I'm doing is I'm working with uh, Otter Sigurdsson and Helgi Torvison and, and Jim Head, of course, from Brown University. What I'm, what I'm, what we're trying to do is to produce packages of information, including Lockheed, but of course, we're going to be upstaged tremendously by Kate, Katrin, Kleeman. <laughs> but anyway, we're, we're going to, uh, we're going to cover the history of the geology, the geomorphology of that particular event, or take a table mountain, for instance. Um, how do they form? Where do they exist? Um, there, we know they're on Mars, so they must have had a glacial origin, um, at least the ones that we're looking at. And then we're going to show a vertical aerial photograph, a stereo pair. So you will be able to look at it in 3D. Um, we'll use any digital models that we have. We'll probably use the Arctic DEM excerpts from Iceland for each of these forms if they're big enough. Um, a geologic map, a topographic map, ground photographs, oblique aerial photographs. You know, it's going to be both visual and textual. And the text will also include, like in the case of, of Lockheed, um, I have four solid pages of references on Lockheed, which I'm sure that Catherine Kleeman has more than that. But anyway, um, there's quite a literature, and I've already added her book to it, even though it's in press. But uh, I, it'll be a great resource for, and it's the same thing with the glaciers that we've been doing. I, we are just publishing the last of 11 volumes of Glaciers of the World mm -hmm. um, by the US Geological Survey. And that's available all online, including the synthesis volume that was published in 2012 on uh, snow, snow, glaciers, floating ice, and permafrost. Um, there's enormous amounts of information if you know where to look. That particular series has every single glacier, glacierized areas on the world, looking at it from the trees, not from the, I mean, looking at it from the forest, not from the trees, because we, of course, couldn't possibly do that, like the Randolph inventory to try to get to each glacier. We've mm -hmm. done that in Iceland, and we hope to do a similar thing on the volcanoes, because Iceland is representative of most of the volcanic types that you'll find on Earth and Mars. <laughs> so Athena Ginudi, she's asking uh, if you have any proposals or how to use these elevation models in the classroom for secondary indication. Say so again, is that to me? Yes. So oh. if you have any ideas, any proposals to use uh, digital elevation models in the classroom for um, high school students. No, I haven't. I've worked with the American Geosciences Institute on one of their books, uh, and with a group of people, much like your teachers, uh, trying to get some of this stuff out. I've worked for years on global environmental change and looking at the Earth as systems, you know, the biosphere, the geosphere, and et cetera. I didn't have that, that proposal. One of my lectures is on planetary volcanism, where I compare Mercury and Venus and Mars and what have you. Um, I, I, I do have always thinking about teachers at all levels of education as to how they can use these materials and make sure that it becomes available digitally. 
that that's my contribution to the science in addition to the hundreds of papers that have been published but i always have keep my mind on the idea that this needs to be in the classroom as well that's essential i i agree so i think we still have some more questions uh Alison moran uh, leaving for iceland tomorrow lucky Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> uh, lucky one. Any must, any must do spots that will be accessible early April. Uh yeah. Oh well, not in the center of the island because most of the uh, gravel roads across the island in the center will still be snow covered. But the the best place to go is the south coast. Go along the south coast. You can visit the um, uh, the waterfall. Iceland, by the way, has the wrong name. It should be called waterfall land. <laughs> For anybody that's been there in the spring, in particular, when the snow is melting, there are waterfalls everywhere. Salyalans Foss, Skoga Foss. You can go out onto the Solheima Outlet Glacier, which is retreating, very easy to get to. Uh, you can visit other glaciers in Skafta, uh, into Vatnajökull National Park, um, all along the south coast. If you're only there for a few days, that's really the route to take because um, it's easy to visit places. All of the gas stations have, they're called nesties. They all have little tiny restaurants so you can get food, which we never, in the old days, there wasn't any gasoline, there wasn't any food either. But now it's very easy as an individual to rent a car um, and go on Route 1 and, uh, and travel to these places and visit them and take your time and enjoy yourself. Thank you for the tips. So I'm giving priority for the non-committee members. So Fatis, do you wanna, you can use, okay, Fatis no. from, from Greece. Hello, of course, that's for Titus. Hello to everybody. I'm sorry, I have no camera for the moment. I have to tell you that it was a marvelous presentation. I am going to use it as it is in the classroom. Uh, also, I, my, I have three students from my classroom who are attending this now, right now, and they, are, they, uh, they liked it very, very much. It was a very, very interesting presentation for the volcanoes in Iceland. And uh, we are, we have such a, a such a piece uh, in uh, in our book of geology at school, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the volcanoes and the whole case of Iceland. And uh, I think it would be a very very interesting topic to start talking this, and it would be a very very interesting thing if I had the opportunity next year to invite uh, Richie at school via internet to have a small presentation in my classroom. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, very much. So it's a challenge for you, Richie. Yeah, I, I appreciate that very much. So Richie's uh, email address is on the brochure so you can contact him afterwards. For yeah, it's geoinfo at comcast.net. Okay, Costas, your turn. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Williams, for this nice presentation. You're welcome. Um, um, I have the following question. You saw this, um, you mentioned at one slide about the fishing village where um, uh, the glacier is melting. And so uh, because of his static adjustment of the crust, uh, the village might not be coastal anymore. Correct. So I was wondering if because of climate change at the end of the century, all ice disappears from uh, Iceland, do we expect because of the relief of the pressure on the crust to have more volcanism? And if yes, do we have from the uh, end of the last ice ages any uh, evidence supporting such an argument? 
I, I, your question is a really good one. It is absolutely correct mm -hmm. that when you have isostatic adjustment and loss of ice, you're likely to have increased volcanism because the glacier, uh, the, uh, the, the sources of the lava is, are fairly shallow, you know, within the crust. So those small adjustments are, are more, more likely. And there have been several papers, I can't think of one right off the bat, that have predicted that that is exactly what will happen, that your volcanism will increase. Um, so that, that idea has been put, set forth. I don't think we have that much. I mean, after all, uh, most of the ice disappeared in Iceland about 10,000 years ago and then came back. Um, you know, as the climate changed off and on. Some of it stayed at the higher elevation. For instance, all of the Greenland ice sheet disappeared, except for some small places uh, during the last interglacial. And as I've written in the past, 20 years ago, you better keep your eye on Greenland because Greenland has seven meters equivalent you take about 300 cubic kilometers of ice and you melt it and you raise global sea level one millimeter. Greenland has enough ice stored that if it were to melt like the last interglacial 130,000 years ago, you would have the sea level go up seven meters. Uh, that would be a catastrophe for most coastal regions on the planet. And I mean, here I am on the east coast of the United States. Every single coastal airport would have to be relocated. I've often said that the cost of having to accommodate what's going to happen, at the, and it's happening at a much faster rate than scientists predicted as much as two, 20 years ago, that it's going to be equivalent to our defense of spending. We spend a, a trillion dollars a year in the United States on the Defense Department. And uh, we're going to have to exceed that because people are going to demand help uh, because all places like Miami are going to go completely underwater. And so that city as it, it currently exists, New Orleans, all of the coastal cities, Annapolis is now going underwater periodically during spring tides. Same thing in Miami. It just is going to get worse. I mean, that's another whole subject for a for is is the impact of the melting of glaciers whether it be green remember if you take all the mountain glaciers of the world the best you can get is a half a meter of sea level so even when you look at ice and you say wow that's a lot of ice but that's only good for what one centimeter for global sea level rise but you've got antarctica with 65 meters worth You've got uh, the other ice sheet, Greenland, with seven meters. It's Greenland that one that's the one that's the most vulnerable. But we're now seeing signs of Antarctica beginning to fail. The big ice shelves that are buttressing the glacier ice that's on land. Uh, I think this is going to become one of the great the rest of this century. I won't be around, but anyway, you guys will. Um, I think it's going to be one of the great issues that are going to have to be tackled uh, and we're not doing a good job right now on all of these UN conferences on climate change. Uh, there's good words, there's the IPCC, but nobody's doing anything really about it. And Hoffman is just a measurement Hoffman in that little town in southeast Iceland, right, their fishing business is going to be out, done. Um, because it'll be dry land at the rate they're going right now. Did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's a it's Thank a disturbing disturbing thought. Um, so Phil, we still yeah, have I... time for one last question before we open the um, the the rooms for people to do yeah. their networking. And Costas still has some uh, words to say to finish the, the, the workshop as well. So feel yeah, great. I think it kind of follows on from what Richie was just saying. It's, it, you talked a lot, Richie, about all the different natural hazards over there in Iceland. And you mentioned about the Icelanders' view on it in terms of 
you know, they essentially throw money at it. They get together and they fund, you know, the solution once the problem has occurred. Correct. But with it being such a um, volcanic, glacial-ridden, earthquake-threatened area, is there a lot of um, preemptive work happening in the background to enable them to live and develop as they currently are? Because, you know, you spoke of the population of Reykjavik effectively doubling in, what, 30 years? So, so how, do they, how do they deal living in such a, a dangerous land, really? I don't know. The, the interesting about the Icelanders um, as, a, as a cultural group aside from the fact that they've maintained their language through thick and thin, which is absolutely miraculous when you've considered the Danes had control of them. Of course, that one, they wanted that to be the major language, but the Icelanders kept their original Norse language, which knit them together as a group, no matter where they live. You do not find any dialects of Icelandic to speak of anywhere in the island. It's all still, unlike Switzerland, where you may go from va va valley to valley and have a different dialect in German or whatever. In Iceland, they have stayed together as a cooperative group um, that is quite, quite amazing. And they have all groups of people working on these problems. They are also, at one point, I don't think they finished it, they were trying to develop a new constitution that would, in encompass more environmental issues than the original constitution. Um, another thing they're doing is they're trying to figure out how to develop a submarine cable that can go from Iceland to Ireland or Scotland to take their hydropower and export it to Europe. Now, I mean, hydropower is, um, I mean, it does damage the land and inundates to produce the reservoir, reservoirs and stuff like that. But of course, it's going in the right direction. The United States could sue the dame, it could do the same darn thing because it has huge areas in, in southern Alaska that abut British Columbia where they have ice and steep rivers and thousands, thousands of meters of elevation differential. They could build hydropower there. DC uh, transmission. I mean, there are solutions to these things if people would get together and put their minds at it. You're quite correct, Phil. It's a matter of willpower with minds that can actually, the engineering that's needed. Uh, it, it, the, many of these things are solvable, but to be honest with you, the biggest single problem we have are people. We're heading to eight. Eight, we're heading to 8 billion. We may not stop at 10 billion. How many Earths do we need to support those people? So that's another whole issue that nobody talks about because of the religious, you know, factions that never want to discuss that in public. So, I mean, these are all things educational the teachers have to try to deal with and then deal with politicians that don't want them discussed. Uh, but I mean, this is, these are really phenomenal challenges that we have as a people. But the Icelanders serve as an interesting model of how a small society can actually agree on something. Remember, they only have 63 members of parliament. I mean, heck, we have what, 437 members of the house and another 100 senators and none of them can agree on anything. I kind of see what you mean in terms of their unitedness. We see it in, in a simple terms, just in their football team and the support that that football team gets. They play as a team and, and have done remarkably well. And maybe that's, you know, a reflection on Icelandic outlook generally. Yeah, it is. It is. Remember, I guess it was two years ago when they took on the Brits. Uh, yeah. I didn't want you to mention that very cheap, but anyway. <laughs> that was quite exciting. <laughs> Uh, David and Goliath. Indeed. A good well, a biblical quick, story. There are a couple yeah. of quick questions in the chat, Richie, which we should get to because they're from teachers rather than uh, the committee. Yeah. Um, Karas asks, how much does the sea level averagely rise right now every year? Do you know that? Uh, it's about four, uh, four pennies, four millimeters per year. Okay. And it's accelerating. Um, 
between the beginning of, uh, between 1900 and 2000, it went up about uh, a third of a meter in, in the Eastern United States. I mean, we can see that in harbors that have granite walls. We can see, you know, where it was from pictures and where it is now. Um, but it seems to be accelerating um, about four millimeters per year. Well, but that, the East Coast of the United States, because of the Gulf Stream and the forcing of water to the West, because of the Gulf Stream and the speed and the volume of water, we have a higher sea level potential than other areas. So it is not exactly the same all over the world. Okay, and the final one, Dionysus asks, um, how does exist a glacier over a volcano? Would the heat of the lava underneath not melt the glacier? Well, most of the time, the surface, unless it's an active geothermal layer, and I'm, that, that's, I could have shown a picture of the northern part of Vatniok or where I've been, where the glacier is missing because of high temperature geothermal activity, keeps the snow from accumulating there. But that's just a little localized area. Um, most of the time, the, the surface of the earth is, uh, in effect, on the bottom of the glacier is at, at freezing or, or below freezing. And so uh, the, it's only when you get a fissure opening up that the lava wells up that it melts the ice. Um, I mean, look at Eifat the Yokel. It's been a long time since there was eruption there. Um, we do see depressions in the calderas every once in a while, ice cauldrons, where it says it's melting from below. Um, and so the ice is subsiding over that melt thing. But it's not a volcanic eruption. It's probably just geothermal activity at the base. Thank you so much. You're welcome. A, so, a great, very, thank you very much, uh, Helder. Thank you. Thank you. And, I think uh, you deserve a Costa. mutual round of applause. <laughs> so everyone is clapping, I'm sure. Yeah. And anyway, I think uh, people as your contact and uh, in the near future, you'll be uh, receiving some emails from uh, enthusiastic teachers. Yo, oh, good. I like enthusiastic events. teachers. That's the best kind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're most welcome. So Thank Costas, you. it's your time to wrap up and uh, give some final, we'll share some final words with the with the participants and afterwards we will move to the networking event okay i'll be very uh, quick um, um i would like uh, to thank very much uh, uh, today's speakers but also the speakers of the other days who might be here or may not be here uh, for this uh, very nice and interesting uh, workshop uh, I would also like to thank uh, the teachers who attended the uh, workshop. Um, and uh, we hope that um, in, the, in the coming years, we would be able again to have uh, uh, in-person workshops because uh, as nice as they can be, the uh, internet workshops, uh, the in-person is also a very nice experience. Um, and uh, I would also like to ask the teachers uh, to complete the evaluation form so that they help us improve future uh, workshops. And um, um, that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Costas. So I think um, we had a, a rich and full week of uh, traveling around the world with the different aspects of uh, geosciences with different inputs in, and uh, even the interdisciplinarity between uh, different um, topics and uh, even art today. So uh, I think it was a great week of sharing and uh, now we will have the opportunity to continue and uh, we'll divide randomly the teachers in different uh, rooms so you can uh, uh, share your experiences and who knows start uh, uh, some new interesting uh, collaboration projects so 
let's uh, open uh, a few rooms and um, and see you soon. Thank you, Helda. Thank you. Thank you, Helda. Okay, Richie, I don't know if you want to stay. Yeah, I'm just going to say thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a very uh, exciting morning for me, and I appreciate very much all of the very nice comments from teachers and others, and uh, hope we can get together again sometime. Okay, it was a really pleasure to, to listen to your talk, especially in with this uh, first end impression that you gave us with your own pictures uh it was really really interesting yeah well, thank good. you so much and okay. if you want to share your um the link for your presentation next week probably steve will do that afterwards okay and we can share the, the link with the with the participants in this workshop yeah i'll ask him yeah mm -hmm. yeah make sure he it ties in with you and tells you what the link is because i'll be talking about planetary volcanism mm -hmm. I'm going to start with the Andromeda galaxy, by the way. <laughs> cool I, want to give, I want to give the big picture. <laughs> Three times 10 to the 23rd stars Whoa. in the universe. Uh, you know what Carl Sagan said, there are, more gra there are more stars in the universe than grains of sand on the beaches of the earth. Yeah, the uh, I've never forgotten that as a young person. Yeah, famous sentence from the Yeah, it's wonderful. I as and it's fun to transmit that type of information to the student and see how it mulls around in their brains. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I'm always available too. You have my email. If you ever mm -hmm. have any extra questions or you need anything, uh, please uh, don't be bashful. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. On to other things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you.